coming. Uh, as Ethan mentioned, my name is Sam. I love sports. <laughs> it's a good time to love sports. It's a good time to be a sports fan. Um, and, you know, working at Nashville, I see firsthand daily um, just sort of the explosion of appetite and appreciation that fans have for sports and how much um, more they can engage and express themselves today as opposed to 10 years ago. Um, so seeing that every day at work, it's exciting to be here with these folks today since they all have really deep insights into the sports space from a variety of perspectives. Um, now, I know that the Olympics are still fresh in everyone's mind and the Paralympics are still going on over in Sochi. Um, so I was gonna kick things off by asking Lauren um, to just kind of outline how the uh, USOC's processes have changed and their infrastructure has changed, you know, going back to 2010 in Vancouver to 2012 in London um, through 2014 in Sochi as far as how you and your broadcast partners deliver content um, across platforms and to fans when, where and when they want it and how that's sort of just shifted since the last, uh, last few games. Yeah, sure. Well, thank you for having me. I'm glad to be here talking about one of my favorite topics, the Olympics and Paralympics. Uh, you know, to look at the landscape from <clears throat> Vancouver to London to Sochi, one of the biggest changes for us is that now we're looking at two really new, wonderful platforms in mobile and social. So in Vancouver, uh, social is basically just a twinkle in our eye, and we had a little tiny Facebook account, a little tiny Twitter account. <clears throat> and in London, we'd really grown to almost 4 million social media followers. Now we're almost at 6. So this is a whole new platform, and, and we did a lot in London to try to understand how that audience wants to consume content. Do they want us breaking news when you're in a time shift at Olympics, or don't they? So that was really important to us, and what we're doing now is really focusing a lot on mobile. So for those two new platforms, social and mobile, from Vancouver till today, you know, our processes have changed a lot because we've been thinking a lot, planning a lot, producing a lot, selling a lot against the, the two new platforms on social and mobile. You know, the other thing is that your fans start breaking your news for you in social media. So that's something that we had to learn from Vancouver to our tiny little Facebook audience, uh, you know, to say, Apollo just won his eighth gold medal, and fans would immediately say, don't tell us it hasn't happened yet. So we've sort of tried to learn what the audience is looking for. A lot of times now we'll use social to try to drive tune into the, the fabulous broadcast on NBC, even if it's coming later. Cool. And so for Getty Images, um, you know, creating this sports content, um, and you've been partners with the IOC and the USOC for several games now, uh, Janie, can you just kind of give us a sense of, of the scale of covering in Olympics, like for example, Sochi, what you guys have on the ground and just what all goes into making this happen? You bet. I mean, it took over 2,300 hours of preparation for us to have our team up and running by the time we all arrived there, which was 10 days prior to the Olympic Games. This time, the size of our team was 70 people strong. We had over 37 photographers, 16 editors full-time based in the main media center, and then I had a team of 12 just working for me on the sponsor of photo assignment service team. Um, we shot a million frames, over six and a half terabytes of images, of which was edited down to about 55,000 frames that were posted to the Getty site throughout the 17 games and during our uh, preview leading up to the games. And at the same time, besides sport, you have to remember we're also capturing news stories around the games, whether it's housing issues or stray dogs or um, political situations, um, as much as we are covering uh, royals and heads of state that may be in attendance and such as well. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the actual production side of the games is, is a pretty huge operation and to think we only had 70 people in Athens, which usually your summer games team is 25 to 30 percent larger, and that the Sochi team was the same size as our summer team in Athens, um, watch out Rio, you know, could be yeah. 120 people by then. So, um, you know, our editorial customer base and certainly our commercial customer base drives the size of our team on site to help leverage who we are and to build the content to satisfy all those customer bases. Yeah, it's uh, fascinating. I mean, terabytes of photos and, and miles of cable is a pretty crazy way to contextualize it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so Simon to my left here is probably, I would say, as well versed um, in the ins and outs of fan behavior and fan trends as probably anyone um, in the industry. So I just wanted to kind of widen the lens here for a minute and uh, ask you, Simon, um, you, you, you uh, presented earlier uh, this week actually about research you've been doing called Passion Shift, right? Can you kind of just give us an outline of um, who is the most engaged sports fan now? Who are the people that sponsors would want to look at um, as 
you know, potential customers and clients, and how is this shifting um, as opposed to what you know, we might have assumed prior? Yeah, I think Lauren kind of touched on it earlier about how the fan experience has just completely changed over the last, certainly the, the last four years. Um, just in terms of the proliferation of all these alternate platforms, which is fantastic. From a fan perspective, you've now got the opportunity to make that choice as to, you know, do I wait for the primetime TV show or do, or do I follow the things that I really care about in real time? Um, which, again, from a fan's perspective, is fantastic to have that choice and that flexibility to actually follow just what it is that you want to be following, um, oftentimes in real time. Um, but it's also a little bit terrifying if you're uh, our client, BMW, who is trying to engage with Olympic consumers, because in the old world, it was very simple. Uh, people tuned in for primetime broadcasts on NBC, and that's how you reach Olympic fans. Now, um, because of this proliferation and fragmentation in terms of how content is consumed uh, by their target audience, uh, it's a big challenge for them to figure out how do we reach them and, and how, how are fans fans in this day and age. Uh, so a lot of the work we do is to help them navigate uh, the complexity of being a fan in the modern world. And what we found is, uh, in the research you alluded to, when you look at level of interactivity amongst fans, there's almost a perfect correlation there between how interactive a fan is and what level of uh, brand love you're likely to see in those fans. Um, the level of uh, brand affinity and brand trial and brand switching and the impact that sponsorship can have uh, increases in an almost direct correlation to um, interactivity. So again, thinking from our client's perspective, being on uh, digital social media platforms is a way to have a presence in an environment that you know is going to be rich in terms of consumers who are predisposed to looking favorably, favorably upon brands who are investing in things that they care passionately about. And you know, that's the wonderful thing about sports is consumers care passionately about it. Sure, uh, that, that social uh, sort of explosion, not to be too cliche here, but that presents challenges for uh, you, Janie, um, and for Getty. Um, you know, you guys took recently a, a pretty uh, big step in, in changing how you deal with, you know, what can kind of be like a wild west online as far as uh, content rights and who, who can use what. Um, can you kind of just run down for people what you guys have done recently to address, uh, you know, social media and, fan, and fans using content and, um, and why? I think we knew where the industry was, you know, we were concerned certainly about the fact that a lot of our um, um, consumer base was certainly uh, accessing our content, not, not necessarily with permissions to do so. So um, last, last week we announced that um, our new embed model, whereby from our photographers to, to our followers here, um, for editorial use only, consumers can access uh, the Getty content by clicking on the embed logo on our site and take advantage of using small resolution content in a non-commercial way, whereby it clicks back to Getty in the commercial ad space or the advertising space would be um, absorbed, if you will, or, or managed by Getty images directly. So for us, it was a way of where the, where the industry was heading and why not be the first to in, indeed embrace what the folks were already doing. And hopefully down the road, there's a significant um, impression and revenue stream that makes sense for us all. Sure, it's fascinating to see. Um, so Lauren, you know, again, sticking this uh, theme of you know, multiple platforms now, um, for you guys and for your broadcast partners, you know, fans want, some fans want straight news. They want to know who won and, and the, the nuts and bolts of the game or the match or the competition. Mm -hmm. um, some fans want more deeper analysis of strategy. Some fans want to see, uh, you know, human interest, backstory kind of things. Does this, you know, multiplicity of platforms allow you guys more freedom and your broadcast partners and your digital partners more freedom to tell more stories? Yeah, I think freedom's a great word because <clears throat> that is what's happening. We are able to distribute content in different ways according to the ways that fans want to see it. And I think NBC does it beautifully, streaming all events online if you want to watch them in their entirety in the time it, it happens, even if it's two in, a, 2 in the morning New York time. 
But what we've started doing is really responding to how we think fans want the content. If it is, you know, breaking news in Russia and, and someone just scored a gold medal that, you know, someone just earned a gold medal that we weren't expecting, we might use a really beautiful Getty image with a lot of emotion, put that up on Facebook, put that up in Twitter and say, you know, drive a tune-in message to the NBC broadcast later with actual broadcast times. So that might be a quick way to grab that person's attention, grab their emotion, let them know, I've got to see it, something amazing happened. Um, and, and then other ways, we obviously distribute a lot of long-form content on our YouTube channel, which has over 60 hours of programming now. So something like a partnership with our partners at BMW about the engineering of the bobsled and how that was built, that might start three or four months before with a lot of planning and a lot of meetings. We put together really stylistically beautiful video content that we release at certain times, like on the morning that Steve Langton and Steve Holcomb are about to jump into that BMW bobsled and earn the first bronze medal, the first medal for the U.S. in two-man bobsled in 64 years. So we definitely try to adapt differently to the platforms. One of the things we did this year, which we've never done before, is for the first time the USOC launched an online virtual game, which we called Pin Sanity. This is totally different for us. Janie's a pinhead, so she knows all about this. She loves these Olympic pins. You probably hear there's this huge on, you know, on the on the ground pin trading activity going on in Sochi. So we tried to package that, bring it back to fans. And one of our most popular pins was when Ted Ligeti won his gold medal. So that's turning around a little piece of graphic artwork mm -hmm. on your Facebook page really quick, responding to Ted Ligeti's gold medal and throwing it out there for your Facebook audience. So we're trying to adapt as much as possible. Sure. Um, so, I mean, that's one way to, to reach fans. And Simon, I'm curious, again, you, you do all this research on, on fans and their behavior, and, and there's you know, tons of data and information. Um, but then, what do you tell sponsors, uh, say, for example, BMW, um, what can they do with that data, and what will that look like in, what, in how they reach fans and, and leverage online content? I think, I mean, data is fantastic. And uh, you know, one of the interesting things is, we're dealing with emotions here. I mean, that's the key marketing asset that the USOC delivers is these incredible stories and the ability to capture America's imagination. And you know, for 17 days, everyone's social calendar grinds to a halt and you rush home to watch um, short track speed skating or, <laughs> yeah. um, or curling. And there's a reason for that, and that's because you know, when you look at what actually drives their passion, it's an affinity for their athletes, these hometown heroes, it's nationalistic pride for Team USA, and as a sponsor, being able to tap into those emotions, be it, you know, the stories that are being told through the Getty images and the NBC editorials, or just tapping into that raw tribalism of Team USA, it offers BMW an opportunity to engage people with their brand in a way that's non-traditional from their perspective. It's no longer, you know, showing cars sweeping down these mountain passes and talking about uh, fuel efficiency or performance. It's an opportunity for them to talk about, you know, their design center and the materials, the carbon fiber materials that are going into I-series fuel efficient vehicles in a way that's completely different and is passion-based. It's telling the story through the sled and the design process and um, engaging affluent Americans who care, who's their target audience, who care passionately about the Olympics. And you know, having the data to demonstrate exactly what drives their target audience's um, passion for the Olympics and showing that for the more affluent consumer, it does skew towards that storyteller type fan um, is, is essential in, in being able to develop communications and activations that are gonna be relevant and compelling to their target audience because it's grounded in why they care, why they're a fan, and you know, those very rich emotions that, that are a very powerful marketing asset for BMW when they activate around their USOC relationship. Yeah. Um, do you feel like like brands, um, in what ways do you feel like brands see sports as offering um, a special emotional appeal that maybe, you know, uh, other sectors of our daily lives don't? Do you think that they really see this as something to, to pull on or is this something that um, that's a real opportunity still to be exploited? Yeah, I, um, I think we, we talk about choice a lot and the, the choice that technology enables. 
And when you give consumers a choice, they tend to choose things they care passionately about. One of those things they care passionately about is sports. Um, we were, I was in a session um, yesterday with the NBA and NASCAR and the NFL, and the lady from the NBA um, threw out one of the Nielsen statistics, which is when you look at all of television programming, it represents 1.8% of television programming. When you look at social media, it actually represents 46% of the television-related social media activity. So, you know, it's a completely disproportionate amount. Why? Because sport is something that humans care passionately about ever, you know, since the original Olympic Games. Yeah, no, that's a fact. Um, so that's, yeah, that's, that's great on, on the leveraging <laughs> side. Now, on the sort of um, producing side of this, this content, um, I was gonna ask you, Lauren, and then you, Jenny, maybe you can offer your own perspective of how you guys make your partnership work as far as what you offer one another and how you've kept this relationship, um, you know, something that's been going on for a couple of decades now. Yeah. Well, you know, for us, it's probably twofold. The, the process, as Ethan said, Janie's been to 10 games and having a representative who understands your business so well, she, you know, they just anticipate what we're going to need, not just Janie, but the photographers that she's assigned. They know what's coming up. They also understand our sensitivities. We're a nonprofit organization. We have certain imperatives. Um, they're specific ways we want to present ourselves, And so it's really good to have a partner who understands who you are, what your mission statement is, what your values are, what you're trying to convey to your fan. So from a process perspective, they end up being a really good partner because of that experience. <clears throat> but at the heart of it, it's just the angles they get. And, and some of the stuff that Getty gets, you know, as an official photographer partner of the IOC, they have some really fabulous access and they get these amazing shots. So I don't know if any of you remember, you know, Sean White's performance, but they've got a shot of him hitting the lip of the half pipe and the board you know, folds in half and you just look at it and you feel like a shudder go all the way back through your spine. You know, and then there's this image a few minutes later with him completely downtrodden with the face turned down. And for us, that's an important part of our story. Sean is a huge part of Team USA and that was a huge part of our games and who he is and how our team performed. And the picture is almost more impactful sometimes when it pops up on Twitter, when it's the headline on our website, you know, when we use it as a lead in for, for something or when it gets on Instagram and all of a sudden it sparks this flurry of emotion from fans saying, Sean, you're still the best. Like you throw the best triple, double 80 corks, whatever. So those photos are important for us to show the emotion of the games. So the, the games are, are truly something that lifts your spirit. And I, the preparation, I mean, we're very sensitive, too, from a rights and clearance perspective, too, working hand-in-hand -hand with their sponsors and licensees. You know, oftentimes clients will come to us and want to use Olympic content, and certainly unless they're a USOC sponsor, um, the dialogue is very simple. You cannot use Olympic content. It's got to happen during, you have to be a USOC partner in order to use such content. So we have to educate our sales force which we're happy to do day in and day out, and also the general commercial customer base as well. But, um, you know, during a game's time and leading up to a game's time, we're sensitive to what the stories are from up and coming, whether it's Paralympians or Olympians. We're sensitive to ensuring that we're covering enough of the um, Olympic trial events that are happening nine months leading up to the games. We're covering the media summits. Um, we hope to ensure that we're um, on the ground floor of understanding what some of those lead stories are heading into the games. And we certainly prepare very much in advance to ensure that the day before each competition, we know what some of the top US stories are gonna be. Mm -hmm. And we ensure that we educate our photographers, but more importantly, my editors, because if we shoot a million frames and we're only editing down to 55,000, you know, I'd like that edited down to about a quarter of a million. I'd like more <laughs> content than less. And uh, I'd like us to ensure we had more editors than 16 on site. But at the end of the day, um, you know, we're ensuring that we know what the key stories are, that we have the depth and breadth of cross opening ceremony, closing ceremony, medal ceremonies, action both at the top of the race course and at the bottom of the race course to ensure that we can tell so many angles of the story that both our editorial customers um, as well as our commercial customers are satisfied what, with what we've obtained. And, you know, for me, it's a great story when I am able to attend a USA-Russia hockey game and um, we shoot 19,000 images with four photographers and seven remotes. And I feel bad for the editors that day to, to have to edit that down. But then I go to yahoosports.com and I go to their homepage an hour later and there's a shot from Getty Images of TJ at center ice facing off with the goalie. And, you know, that's the picture of the day. 
So, you know, we love those sort of, sort of things that both our editorial, I said, and commercial customers appreciate um, the moment in time that we're able to capture. And a picture does tell a thousand words, so it's a great company to work for. Um, so, yeah, there's this theme of kind of with digital, you can produce endless amounts of content. Like, you, in theory, you can never be done. Um, and there's, you know, all kinds of opportunity in that that you just touched on earlier, um, Lauren, about the different platforms that enable different kinds of storytelling and more um, freedom in storytelling. But, you know, are there challenges that come with this um, explosion of platforms and, and social sites as well that you have to deal with? And, and what are some of the ones that um, you feel like you've been able to navigate well and, and, are, and are looking at? Um, today. I would say it's like an insatiable worry that you're not doing enough constantly. Like if I, I feel like, like right now we're very solid on four social media platforms and that makes me paranoid that we're completely, you know, neglecting three others that I haven't heard of. So um, I would say of anything, the biggest challenge for us is keeping up. And as a nonprofit organization, all of our dollars are really committed to helping Olympic and Paralympic athletes sustain their competitive excellence. So we have to be as lean and mean as possible. We have to operate efficiently. But the great thing is that I feel like we've started to learn the best way to distribute different pieces of content, whether it's a small snack bite or about you know a tune-in message to come back later, or some really, really compelling story that has to be told in four minutes in a video. You can't do it shorter. So probably the biggest challenge for us is just making sure that we're staying ahead of the cutting edge trend um, and trying to figure out what's coming. The great thing about it is that because we work so closely with these athletes, we have wonderful access to them. And from you know the 16 year old, a lot of them are very young up to the 25 year old, 30 year old, a lot of them are using these platforms. So as we follow them and get to know them, we see where they are. We see that they're all taking Sochi selfies. Okay, that's gonna be a thing, Sochi selfies. You know, so sometimes the athletes are alerting us where we should be focused. Um, so Simon, you know, these different, you, Lauren just mentioned you can deliver bite-sized bits of content, um, you know, longer form, more human interest, storytelling types of things. Um, these all kind of are ways to reach that engaged sports fan that you were talking about, the one mm -hmm. who's online. Um, how does that differ from how a brand would kind of try to identify who was the biggest sports fan before um, when they might rely more on polling or something like that. Yeah, I mean, historically, our industry has taken the position that if you're looking to change purchase behavior, then the best way to do that is to target the avid fans. And the way you find the avid fans is you ask people how interested they are in sport, and they'll tell you either on a four-point scale how interested they are or on a ten-point scale how passionate they are about the sport, and you'd use that self-reported interest to kind of figure out what are those people doing and how can we tell our story uh, in a way that makes sense for the avid fan. What our research recently found was that maybe self-reported, well, self-reported interest actually is not the best predictor of uh, consumers who are predisposed to supporting sponsors and what actually is a better predictor is this notion of how interactive fans are. So. You know, you can be sure that in addition to what BMW was doing around Sochi with, you know, their Instagram campaign and the Twitter campaigns to uh, make those interactive fans um, aware of the fact that we just won our first medal in 62 years in the mm -hmm. two-man bob, um, there's, there's going to be a lot more to come from, uh, from BMW on those interactive social platforms uh, come two years' time in Rio. Awesome. I'm sure it'll be huge. Um, so, Janie, um, with these social platforms, you guys just recently, uh, like you mentioned earlier, offered up you know, lower res embeds for people to use, watermarked. Um, that's one way you've addressed these challenges that have come with this digital age. But what are some of the uh, advantages that have come for you guys at Getty that you can offer uh, your strategic partners that are relatively new to the last you know, five or ten years with uh, the proliferation of digital and social? I think just... I'm not sure there's other things that we can offer necessarily that are that much different over the last few years because I think we've tried to stay on top of the technology changes and such. I think the fact that, you know, from camera to, to site is mm -hmm. such a speed enhancement these days, mm -hmm. it's such a great tool for them to be able to access content sooner than later mm -hmm. across new sport and entertainment, but it's certainly sport where it's so important from a customer perspective. I mean, social was nothing in Vancouver and sure it picked up some in London, but these days, you know, 
my Kellogg's people were just as excited about getting the image within 10 minutes of mm -hmm. Merrill and Charlie with the American flag behind them when they won the first Paris gold medal ever to mock it up in a cereal box for mm -hmm. Kellogg's to have it on the Today Show the next day, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, the time from, you know, camera to site to product obviously is certainly much faster, even if it's just a simple mock-up these days for a Today Show moment, but um, we're seeing that social is, is everything. Sure. Um, and so, you know, you mentioned Kellogg and then Simon, you mentioned uh, BMW earlier. Um, Lauren, um, what are some of the ways that uh, these brands can use sports content and, you know, for you specifically Olympic content mm -hmm. um, in ways that they might not be able to use other types of content to generate specific types of reactions or feelings from, from these fans? You know, I think the Olympics actually lends itself really nicely to organic marketing partnerships. So whether it's, you know, the athletes marching into the stadium on NBC in front of 100,000 viewers wearing Ralph Lauren apparel, perfectly, you know, suited for them, or it's stories in social media using the imagery from Getty and, and video pieces from NBC about the PNG family home where the athletes' families have a, you know, the displaced families, they come all the way to Russia, but they can't spend time with their athletes in the athlete village because they're not allowed there. So there's PNG popping up a house, welcoming all the families and offering tied laundry services so they can do their laundry while they're there for a week. Um, you know, another perfect organic association is BMW building that sled. It is a great story, but there's so much more to that story. Look, it took them years to build that sled and some engineer at, at, at BMW in North Carolina was assigned with this task, build a bobsled. And he said all he had in common was we knew about going fast. So, you know, it's such a real thing that these, these sponsors and these partners bring so much to our families, to our athletes, to our movement. They really support us in such a way that all we have to do is tell the story. And all our business development team has to do is find those really good organic connections and then find the platform where they work best. For example, with BMW, it just worked best on video. You, you just have to do it in video. So I, I think that we're lucky in that they really do support us. We're not just slapping a logo on something and saying we're partners. They really are supporting us. Um, Simon, um, so speaking of, of BMW, you know, how, how do you guys present your research to a partner like BMW? Do you just give them, um, give them the data and say do with it what you will or do you sort of like tailor some, some strategies or, or some case studies and things like that, or is it more of a, a dialogue and a, and a sort of ongoing process? It, it's a partnership. Um, clearly, they understand the ultimate driving machine and their target audience very well and their brand. And we understand fans very well. We understand why fans are fans, and we understand how fans are fans. So helping them um, develop communications that are relevant and compelling to the fans and helping them support their partners and add value to the fan experience and provide opportunities for fans to give back to the USOC through test drive programs where for every mile that they drive uh, a BMW vehicle in a test drive, a dollar goes back to the USOC. And again, you're, you're ta tapping back into that emotion of fans wanting Team USA to do well and wanting to support those athletes. So. It's being able to advise our clients, you know, why, why fans care? How do we de use that information to develop uh, communications and activations and use content to tap into that rich emotion? And then how fans are fans, so how do we get that message out there? And you know, as, as Laura mentioned, video is great. So we developed a, a documentary to tell a story of, you know, how these guys in North Carolina built this sled that, uh, we like to think is the fastest sled in the world. So mm -hmm. um, it's, it's a partnership, you know, sure. using their understanding of their product and their target audience and our understanding of uh, the fans. How do we use the content and the wonderful marketing asset that is fan passion to, to help them sure. think about the vehicle? So, so you produce the content, you, you use the content, and then um, you have to sort of uh, evaluate how you used it and what was good and what was bad moving forward. Um, for a nonprofit like the USOC Learn, mm -hmm. what are some of the different um, things you look at uh, in fan behavior as far as um, you know, kind of tracking and engaging um, how much you're engaging fans and how much you're bringing them in uh, to the USOC fold in the way that, that you want them? 
For us, success has a lot of different um, a lot of different metrics on digital media. If we're looking at the relationship we've built with a brand, you know, whether it's City right now presenting the live streaming action from the Paralympics in Sochi, we might look at impressions. How many times did that pre-roll pair you know pair with a companion ad drive a click through? It's pretty straightforward. The ROI we're looking at there. Um, as you mentioned, we are a nonprofit organization. We do have to drive donations. All of our teams are supported by sponsors and by donations. We don't receive government funding. So you know. Every Every single month, every single year, we're tracking our online fundraising. Did it go up? It should go up. Look how big our on online audience went up. Um, another way that we track uh, track our own success on digital is through engagement. So, you know, a few years ago, coming out of from Vancouver to London, we, we were just like, we got to get big. You know, there are 300 million Americans, and they're all fans of the Olympic team. We got to get bigger. But now we've really been tracking engagement in the last two years. Will our fans tell our story for us? Are they our brand advocates? Will they retweet? Will they share? Will they blog? Will they Facebook post? Will they like? You know, we love those engagement stats because we are all behind the team. It's like, you know, if you're a New York Jets fan, the entire audience, or the entire stadium should be cheering for the team and that's what that's what the US is so social is a way for us to get all of those fans cheering for us at once giving us their own virtual wave um, that's one of the ways that we will judge our success on digital is through engagement was that a, was that a process as far as figuring out how you were going to measure these things like say in 2010 for example was you know what was it like then were you kind of feeling these things out then and, and how much clearer is it now than it was say four years ago in 2010, at midnight, I carried my laptop downstairs into USA House, which is a hospitality area, because we were at 99,999 fans, and I held my computer up to some guy named Chuck, and I said, can you open a Facebook account and be our 100,000th fan? So because of the Pasquale fans and friendly, friends and family network, the, you know, social media. So yeah, we learned a lot between Vancouver and London. But coming out of London, you're right, Sam, we actually employed a digital agency in New York that we had done a lot of work with, had a lot of faith in, and we did lead a six-week project with them to say, what are the engagement stats we should be tracking? And we can't just say retweets and likes. We know that. But what is powerful? What gets you these two billion impressions? What gets you out in front of the people who love your content so much that they're tweeting about something amazing that happened and not you know, what the girl was wearing or what her hair looked like? So we absolutely employed the work of what we considered a digital media leader in the field, an expert, to say what are the stats we should get behind. And then we applied budget to it. So you know, we put into um, 2013, we put a long-term strategy in an applied budget in an ascending way and came into 2014 with the numbers that we were looking for. Cool. And so Jamie, do you find that your strategic partners are, are specifically looking for um, visual sports content in this sort of quick hit internet um, you know, era that we're living in? Um, are, your, are your partners coming to you saying we want um, images more than ever or are they still part of uh, a bigger picture how they were before, just sort of on more platforms? For the majority of my clients, the commercial clients that I have especially, they all come into a games with a specific client list of, or a roster of athletes and governing bodies that they have relationships with. So we know leading up to the games, like I mentioned across Olympic trial co um, competitions and or specific governing body competitions that the content needs to be built or we hear about it. And we also know going into the games, like I said, their respective shot lists and needs. So I find, I don't think I have a sponsor that doesn't have some sort of advisory staff that's part of their brand mission to embrace and to get their message out and to use, whether it's a Paralympian or Olympian um, or a retired um, Olympian alumni, if you will. So, you know, Peekaboo Street may be as involved as, um, you know, someone may be working with Merrill White and Charlie Davis as they might be working with Sean White. So it really goes the whole realm of retired Olympians <laughs> to Paralympians now to certainly the successful Olympians that we had in Sochi. Sure. Folks want to line up and uh, ask any of their own questions? The mic there? There we go. I see it now. Thank you. We're approaching Brazil pretty quickly, and right now for the World Cup, the, words, the, uh, the word being spread is the accommodations are going to be subpar. Before any of the medals have been awarded this year, the U.S. media and a lot of the athletes had kind of set the tone for Sochi. Obviously, the Sochi fails hashtag dominated the the message for the first two uh, for the first ten days of the Olympics. Your job is to tell the story. What does the USOC plan to do? Well, how did you approach it for Sochi in terms of getting a, a more positive, accurate message? You know, without uh, relying on the medal count, and how do you? 
pulling to uh, address that in 2016 when there's going to be inevitable um, obstacles in Rio? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, it's something we think about a lot because the athletes, you know, I'm I feel like they have so many great qualities in so many ways that they inspire people. And so you want to put those qualities forth and you want to train them with media training and try to encourage them to show that. But <clears throat> at the same time, we don't censor our athletes. So we don't put any restrictions on what they can say or what they can do um, other than the rules of the Olympic Charter, which prevent them from protesting within the field of play against any uh, taking any kind of political stance. And that is to preserve the integrity of the Olympics, which is not supposed to be a political movement. So what we did was we really tried to encourage them to, um, you know, talk about what their experiences were, but at the same time we kept our social media focused on integrating an athlete into that culture and getting them in and getting their apparel for them and getting them into the dorms and getting them into the food, you know, into the, the cafeteria and getting them acquainted and assimilated. and. You know, the amazing thing about the Olympics is you go to this place that's so strange and different, and some of the cultures are exactly the same, and some of them leave you wishing, you know, you were back in America, and some of them really open your eyes to amazing things, and it's, you know, a beautiful thing. Like the volunteers in Sochi were this extremely enthusiastic group of young people who, you know, were trying to learn all these English phrases. It was a delight. So I think you're right, you know, media stories can spin out of control, but hopefully something like TJ Oshie, you know, winning a shootout in this incredibly exciting game against Russia becomes the story. It outweighs anything else that's happening because, again, it connects on an emotional level. So, you know, I guess I would say we kind of wait it out. We wait it out until they do something that really does inspire all Americans with the Olympic values. And in Sochi, of course, we didn't have to wait too long. I think the local organizing committees would probably learn some lessons as well, and you put the press in the nicer hotels. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, people love to complain on Twitter, no doubt about that. Um, is there anyone else who wants to ask a question with the mic? Hey there. My name is Leah. Um, I'm part of the team at Rethink. We're a, a, Can a Canadian creative agency. And um, just maybe a question for everyone on the panel. Um, just about, you know, you were saying, Ms. Marks, about, you know, during that game, U.S.-Russia game, there's 19,000 frames shot. And, you know, always trying to get the highest quality content out there on the web as quickly as possible. So kind of owning the moment. So just wondering if there's maybe any practical rubber meets the road tips that you guys might have to keep processes lean, but still ensure the quality is as high as possible and quick as possible besides driving a BMW uh, to get from one place to another. But yeah. <laughs> wow. See, I thought she was going to ask about the gold medal game. <laughs> <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> you know, at the end of the day, I, think it's, I always think it goes back to how strong um, your bandwidth is in many ways. And certainly, if you don't have the right IT team in place mm -hmm. months ahead of time to ensure that you can deliver all the end of the road deliverables, you're not in a good place. I was going to say something different. But, you know, at the end of the day, you're only as good as your IT and your team that you set up and the equipment that you have. And we're fortunate that we work with the latest Nikon and Canon equipment, obviously, day in and day out. And certainly during the games time, we have access to, um, you know, the best cameras in the world. So, but at the end of the day, if you don't have your technology in place that's supporting your team, then we can't even begin to deliver against the promises to our editorial and commercial customer base. So, you know, we're fortunate that, um, you know, the storage and such is in place and doesn't break down and can withhold, can withhold the, the bandwidth that's, that's, you know, pushed out to that servers, if you will, each and every day during mm -hmm. the games time. So yeah. there's a lot of planning that goes into ensuring that our Seattle backend can withstand what's coming at them. You know, whether it's the Sunday night of an Oscars or 17 days of Olympic games or 30 days of a World Cup. I think Lauren and, and Janie touched on it earlier, which is, you know, to be efficient, I think you need a little bit of a crystal ball and you need to anticipate what the needs are, you know, before the events un, un, unra uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Evolve, no. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, that's the beauty of sport, is it's unpredictable, but um, to some degree, you know what might happen or mm -hmm. could happen. And, you know, from a BMW perspective, get his... Um, ability to capture all of that footage around what we cared about, which was the two-man bobsled, um, is, is, is fantastic. 
um, in the sense that they're using all that technology in a very smart way and, and allocating resources in the ways that are going to deliver what, what we need and what the USOC needs in, in, in real time. So. Yeah, it's, uh, Jamie, you touched on the um, sort of IT side, and at least I'll just go off my own two cents from my own perspective. Um, in my job, like mentioning bandwidth, I think one challenge today is like just human bandwidth. I mean, um, with the web and with uh, who is generating content and how and where, uh, and the different, or how much more creative you can be than you could be 10 years ago. Like, there's no end to how much you could do. Like, when I'm at work, there's, I could never go home, in theory. Like, there's always something else I could write, whether it's a small news hit or a longer feature. Um, and to me, that, at least how I see it, that's one of the biggest challenges that a lot of people are seeing is, um, like, how to do enough but not fall into the trap that you mentioned earlier, Lauren, of um, nothing's ever good enough in, in, a, in a bad way. Yeah. It's interesting. Is there any more questions from the audience? If not, then uh, thank you guys for, for listening to us. And thank you, Jamie, Lauren, and Simon. Thank you, Sam.